change jobs. Uh, to this evening's lecture in the global health in the global south, Montana and mountains beyond mountains lecture series. And uh, we're very privileged and uh, honored to have with us tonight uh, Dr. Andrew Puckett. Uh, he's uh, in orthopedic surgery with the Missoula Bone and Joint Surgery Center. Uh, Andy Puckett has been, uh, he, is, he was raised in Indiana, uh, and then no surprise, he went to Purdue University. Uh, then he did his medical school at um, uh, Indiana University. Um, and he was trained in orthopedics at Indiana University. After that, he received a fellowship in hand surgery at the University of Utah, so he started moving west at that point. Uh, he's been in private practice here in Missoula <coughs> since the completion of his training in 1997, and his first trip to Honduras was in 2005. He's since made, or he's made a total of seven journeys to Honduras, and he's going back there in another two months. The title of uh, Dr. Puckett's lecture tonight is Missoula Medical Aid, Improving Health in Rural and Impoverished Communities in Honduras. So please, please join me in welcoming Dr. Andy Puckett. Well, th thanks everybody. Uh, lecturing is not the first thing I do as an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, I lecture some of my patients, but uh, uh, I appreciate everybody coming and Peter for inviting me and, and Pam. And uh, uh, I have come to Missoula Medical Aid uh, through invitation uh, back in 2005. Uh, I'll back up a little bit, I, you know, uh, became a physician <clears throat> and through training, you don't have any time to think about what you're going to do when you get done, and uh, you, although you dream, and and I always knew that I wanted to do volunteer work, and it's interesting in physician communities, a lot of people talk about doing volunteer work, and a lot of people do do volunteer work, and a lot of people don't, and a lot of people say they're going to do it later in their careers, and. They kind of never get around to it when they're done with their career and they have time. Uh, then they feel too rusty and, and decide against it. And so the, the, my point is it doesn't matter whether you're a physician or what you do for a living. Uh, it's never good to push your opportunity to do volunteer work to later in life. You can always make time. Um, my family's been super supportive of it. A lot of people with young families say, oh, I've got little kids, I can't do it. My wife has been exceedingly supportive of me leaving, and even when we had little kids, uh, because it teaches our kids a lesson too. And volunteerism is an exceedingly important part of our community responsibility. Um, with that being said, I kind of uh, got invited by David Cates to um, join in, he's the executive director of Missoula Medical Aid, uh, on a trip. Doctors uh, have lots of different ways to volunteer and most, a lot of them are through major organizations like Health Volunteers Overseas or their organizations called Interplast, Doctors Without Borders, a lot of people have heard. These are major organizations <clears throat> who have great opportunities around the world, uh, and, but you end up going to a large city in Honduras, for instance, the, to the capital, Tegucigalpa. And uh, what happens there is patients have been identified and they're brought in to the city and they're treated. Uh, and so you get to see and you get to treat more patients than you would in the opportunity that I've been presented um, in going through Missoula Medical Aid. Uh, and I, I found that the, the magic is that we live in a small community who has extended their heart to a, a couple of small communities in Honduras. There are people everywhere that need help. Uh, 
pretty special that our community provides help to this one community. Sure, I'd love to be able to help people on every continent, but one only has so many resources and so much time to be able to do things. Uh, and so th these are the choices we make, and, and if we help one life, it's, it's uh, a great thing. So um, I was invited to, to join in Missoula Medical Aid. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little background on Missoula Medical Aid and uh, then kind of bring it back to some personal things. Almost all my slides are just pictures. Uh, and if anybody has a, a little weak stomach, there's a few kind of hand surgery kind of pictures. Uh, and uh, raise your hand right now if you're going to need a warning about a gross picture. <laughs> because I can give a warning. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, um, anyway, Missoula Medical Aid uh, is it? Maybe, maybe not. Missoula Medical Aid uh, it origins uh, extend from the time of Hurricane Mitch, which was in 1998, which was a devastating hurricane. Uh, of that size. This is the boundary of Honduras. Uh, let's see if I can use the pointer right here. The boundary of Honduras. This is the edge of Cuba. Florida's here. So this is the entire, this is the Gulf of Mexico. And that hurricane filled the whole basin. Uh, it was a giant hurricane. But it came and it settled down off the shore of, of Honduras and actually moved down and across Honduras and circled around. It wasn't the devastating winds and things like uh, Katrina. It was the amount of water that it just deposited on Honduras in places up to 75 inches of water. About 8,000 people by estimates were killed in this hurricane and hundreds of thousands of people literally were uh, displaced from their homes. Uh, so uh, just to go back quickly, you know, the lecture series from mountains to mountains, this is what the countryside of Honduras looks like <clears throat> where we go. Uh, a lot of the country is mountainous. Uh, the mountains remind me, the first time I went there, they really reminded me of the Smoky Mountains. They're not, you know, alpine mountains like we're living in, in this area. Uh, and it's mostly deciduous forests. Unfortunately, a lot of the deciduous forests have been mowed down for agriculture because that's how most people live is uh, sustenance farming. So Honduras uh, is bound, uh, has uh, Nicaragua on its southern boundary, El Salvador on its western, and Guatemala on its northern boundary with uh, coasts, coastal uh, exposure to both uh, the Gulf and to the Pacific Ocean. Tegucigalpa is the capital, uh, and where we work is uh, to the west. Uh, we also uh, serve uh, the, the, the southern or western coast. Uh, most of my, ex all of my experience has been in this town of La Esperanza which is where most of the focus of my talk will be. But uh, so after Hurricane Mitch uh, hits Honduras, uh, there's this outpouring of uh, generosity through uh, an organization here in town called Nightingale Nursing. And they immediately immo uh, mobilized a group of volunteers. And they actually went down to the San Lorenzo area. Some of you, if you've studied at all or seen uh, photos from the time of Hurricane Mitch, they were massive mudslides. And uh, a lot of them were centered down in that southwestern part of the country. <clears throat> the original groups went there to help, not exactly knowing how they would help. And uh, knowing a few of the people that went on the original trips, uh, they were digging out. There was mud around the hospitals. There, I mean, they were doing whatever they could. Not a lot of direct medical care given, but uh, relationships started to build. Uh, from that time, the organization has gradually evolved 
and we have a number of different programs really initially starting out with primary care programs where we go to these two towns uh, we partnered with the worldwide organization Save the Children uh, who have helped us identify these small villages surrounding these larger towns where the primary care groups would go and primarily uh, descend on these towns uh, the town would offer the school and a big primary clinic would just be set up and run for a day and they'll see between 80 and 300 people in a day in these clinics. <clears throat> uh, there's, uh, so that, that's where the kind of nascency of the organization came and it's gradually developed over time. A lot of variety of things have been identified uh, to help uh, improve uh, as, uh, our mission, which, I'm sorry, uh, so the Missoula Medical Aid, and we work with the rural impoverished communities in Honduras as they seek to improve their health and access to health care. So initially, medical brigades developed uh, and through Save the Children, uh, and over time, we gradually developed uh, an offshoot with referral funds. So we garner volunteer funds from the Missoula community uh, and on each trip we take uh, a certain amount of money that we end up leaving with Save the Children and when we identify uh, certain people that we can't really help in the week that we're there, uh, we make referral to try to get people to Tegucigalpa uh, for further care. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, the, uh, then off that, eventually 2003, initially one of my colleagues in town, Gary Wilstein, uh, went along. He was only able to do two cases in trying to figure out what was going on down there in orthopedics. Um, and then I followed one of my other partners, Mike Woods is gone. And as I uh, was introduced, I've now subsequently been down about seven times, or about, I've been down seven times and will be going my eighth. Um, we've gradually grown, uh, and I'll come back to the improved health side, but we've uh, created a dental clinic. Uh, you know, people who have means there get dental care, people without means get no dental care. Uh, we have been able, we've taken dentists down a few times that cost a fair amount of money. We've learned that we hire a dentist who sees patients three hours a day, five days a week, and provides uh, low income and, uh, care uh, to, to folks there. Again, all this comes from Missoula. Uh, we've also created this community medical box, which is a, is a kind of a micro business in these little towns where, uh, and literally the boxes are like a little cabinet this big and they're a small pharmacy. And uh, we stock the pharmacy the first time and have a community volunteer who is, uh, has some degree of education uh, and there's obviously some degree of trust and that person manages this micro pharmacy so people don't have to take a full day out of their farm work to travel to La Esperanza to get uh, anti-diarrheal medication or whatever. They have a bunch of basic medications and the idea is then that we kind of get them on their feet. They can buy the, the medications at wholesale. They take the, the funds that they made, keep reinvesting it and keep medications in their community so people aren't having to take so much time out of their business or out of their farming. Um, on the health, uh, improved the health, some physicians uh, went out to the communities and, and they're seeing these cough after cough after cough. Everybody has this cough. And one of the ER docs here in town said, why do all these people have this pneumonitis, this kind of, they, they don't really seem infected. He went out to their homes, uh, these folks cook in an open stove oven situation in a very small room 
that has about a four inch uh, gap between the roof and the top of the wall. And this open fire, the room's full smoke. We said, what would it take for us to create a change in that environment? For $15, we could build an uh, enclosure on the stove with a small stove pipe out and, and take the smoke out of this room changes, it's a game changer. I mean, people's health vastly improved with a, such a small thing. And now we've tuned it up to uh, three times that much, 50 bucks, but it's making the stoves way more efficient, burning less wood and cooking, you know, cr saving the energy from these few logs that they're putting in the fire. And uh, so, but $50 is $50, which is a lot of money to a lot of those uh, farmers. But we help and, and we create in these communities uh, this ongoing thing and, and it's local people who are building them uh, and we're funding them. Uh, dental hygiene, we've, uh, we provide fluoride, toothbrushes, toothpaste to about 2,800 children a, a year uh, and, and that's on an ongoing uh, manner. They're getting their, uh, getting their fluoride. <clears throat> We've begun to fund two nursing scholarships in La Esperanza. Uh, we take a young per two young people in town from their hometown, hopefully get them trained as a nurse and they stay, or we get them trained as a nurse, hopefully they end up staying in their hometown and providing improved health care. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, some childhood nutrition uh, community-based programs uh, that's uh, really run through Save the Children. Uh, we help fund that. It gets more children in. So uh, as I'm sure uh, most of you are learning, uh, early childhood education, early childhood nutrition really improves a person's ability to learn throughout life. Um, so getting off to the right foot, on the right foot um, will hopefully create an ongoing improvement. And lastly, uh, some community economic development, healthy farms initiatives. Uh, we're helping farmers improve the variety of crops that they're growing. Traditionally, folks there um, grow beans and corn. They eat tortillas and beans. They're not getting uh, a wide array of vitamin and uh, appropriate nutrition. Uh, their climate is perfect for several, uh, uh, for many vegetable lines that they can grow ongoing year round. We've helped create markets for them. Uh, the local people, and you'll see in my pictures, a little more fun to look at as we go, uh, but the Lenka, the local uh, indigenous peoples, uh, have created a co-op, family co-ops, and we've helped them build a small uh, processing center in La Esperanza, so they grow a bib lettuce on all their own small little individual farms, but they bring it all together, make it uniform, get it cleansed, and ironically, the market, the purchaser for them is Walmart in San Pedro Sula. Um, but they can all uh, grow, increasing their income, increasing their ability to feed their family, increasing their ability to send their children to school. <clears throat> so, beginning of my experience, uh, in, uh, in Honduras, uh, you, you arrive in Tegucigalpa and it's a mountainous town and I remember the first time I flew in, they were flying over all these beautiful kind of deciduous forests, kind of semi-tropical, very mountainous, and then all of a sudden everything turned brown and there's this just like burned out area. It was Tegucigalpa as we're flying in. It's the craziest landing strip on the planet. You come in and have to pull a 180 degree turn and, and go through a gap that they blew in the mountain like they blow a highway in in a super short runway. So they hit the ground and just slam on the brakes. I mean, your head almost hits the, hits the chair. 
it's scary. Um, anyway, and then the Save the Children people pick us up, and we drive about three or four hours to, to La Esperanza. So many people are in, loaded in the back of trucks. I mean, there are just people everywhere. Um, and there are people, uh, this picture doesn't represent it, but there are people walking right on the edge of the street everywhere, little kids, everything. You're like, why are there not just people getting hit everywhere? I think there probably are. And this road, you just notice the lack of lines. There are no lines. And you know, people, the bus is going five miles an hour. This thing's going 30 miles an hour. And everybody's passing two, three wide. It's eye-opening. Um, but it's beautiful country. So this is the Save the Children compound uh, that we stay. Uh, they invite us to stay. These are classrooms that we convert to bedrooms, and a lot of us end up sleeping on cots out on this veranda. Things are pretty dangerous in, in Honduras. Uh, sadly, has the highest uh, murder, ca murder rate uh, in the world. Um, so every place is guarded. Um, the the uh, compound has this high fence around it. There's razor wire everywhere. Uh, there's a guard. When the, once the gates close, they're locked at night. And it seems like such a safe town. <laughs> um, and I have no problem walking around that town, all dirt roads. Uh, uh, but still, safety is always a concern. This is what town looks like. There's always puddles in the street. There's always hundreds of kids walking around. There's always drunk people. They're just completely uh, forgotten souls. Um, it's, uh, it's a wild place. This is pretty wild. Everywhere, wires just loaded up. <clears throat> Hardware store. These small uh, buildings are built off of people's homes all over the place. They're called puparia. And they always sell Cokes and chips and other highly unnutritious things for cheap. And people get them, and then they walk out here, they unwrap them and throw the wrapper in there, here. Litter is everywhere. You don't see a trash can. You're starting to see trash cans in a few places, um, and they're always full and heaping over. So this, again, uh, this is the countryside by La Esperanza. You can see um, uh, nice cabbage crops or broccoli crop. I think this is cabbage. Um, and you're starting to see a variety of uh, different uh, crops uh, rather than just corn and, and beans. Um, this is in the market. This is where everybody eats uh, inside this marketplace. Uh, the markets have beautiful vegetables and fruit in varying, uh, varying ways, some more aesthetically placed than others. Uh, beans are beautiful, uh, varieties, dried fish, and um, the people. The people here are just the most beautiful people, and there are children everywhere. It just Your heart just, uh, it, <laughs> it's unbelievable how the feelings that you get. Um, but uh, the clinics, uh, when I arrived the very first time, I went, there were about 200 people outside. My first thought was like the Who concert outside of Cincinnati. I thought it was going to get trampled. Um, but uh, we, we marched through. Uh, I don't speak Spanish. Uh, I have an interpreter each time, which is always a very special relationship uh, that you build, and that person makes or breaks you. Uh, and I've had some unbelievable people uh, to work with when I've been there. Um, but, but the folks, um, uh, like I was telling you earlier, the indigenous folks are mostly the people we see. We see a, a fair amount of people of uh, Hispanic origin as well, but uh, mostly the indigenous Lenca. These are families. This is a young man who had had a broken elbow, pardon me, uh, and I performed what's called an osteotomy on him and uh, realigned his bone. He spends the night in the hospital. Nursing staff is very minimal in the hospitals. The families always stay with the, with the family uh, or with the patient uh, and feed them, bring food from outside. They really don't cook much in the hospital that they serve to the, 
to the patients. Just a number of people. This is a young, this woman's 22. And she's not really that much shorter than me. That's a perspective, but she was very much shorter than me. They're small people. Um, she'd had an elbow dislocation for three months when I saw her. What's amazing uh, learning to, for me was a lot of the things that I see there are things of historical interest only in the United States. Uh, things that I saw in textbooks 20 years ago which hadn't been seen for 20 years uh, prior to that are, are, being, uh, are commonplace things that I see down there. Bringing me back to what I was talking about a little bit earlier about um, working with these large organizations like health volunteers overseas, what I realized in this uh, small uh, organization is that by going to a town three hours away from, from the capital, I realized this woman would never get treated. She would lived with that elbow dislocation her whole life. There is no way that these people, very few of them, would ever go to Tegucigalpa, which is only three hours away. I mean, it's like driving to Bozeman, you know? We don't think twice about going to Big Sky, going skiing, you know? And these people can't get to, to Tegucigalpa if you paid, I mean, and we do try to pay them uh, to get some of them there. Um, uh, so that is where probably the greatest satisfaction that I realized on my first trip there was by being involved in a small, nimble organization that I was able to treat people that would never be treated. Yes, I could go somewhere and treat 100 people, or I can go somewhere else and treat 20 people, 15 people that uh, forever will be, uh, their lives will be changed. They'll be able to uh, uh, return to their life in agriculture. Um, and they probably would have just plugged along as the one-armed farmer uh, or, or whatever their problem is. Uh, so just these beautiful people and these little kids with looks like that, they break your heart. This is a, this is a woman carrying her uh, maize, ground maize around to make her tortillas. Here you go, now you can see the litter. That's pretty normal. Another old farming family, a uh, woman in traditional uh, Linka uh, clothing. Here you go. This is at one of the primary care clinics out at the schools. Everybody, these people dress like this every day. In town, there's a little more kind of modern wear, and these kids have their uniforms. These are two lucky boys who go to school every day. Um, and this is just outside the Save the Children place where we stay and uh, just see these kids going to school. And as opposed to this young lady who uh, is barefoot, hiding, scared, kind of scared but curious, um, peeking out from around the truck, likely homeless with her family, family sitting there behind the truck. This is a very typical household. The clothes hanging out, there's always some kind of thing sitting in the yard, and there's usually these beautiful bougainvilleas right in the middle of this kind of dusty yard. So this was my interpreter, a um, uh, fellow who used to live here in Missoula, um, unfortunately had to move to Albuquerque because of his job, but uh, he was my lifesaver on my first trip. Super gregarious guy, uh, he's Dominican. American and uh, everybody loved him and because of him I was able to get a lot of things done. But this is the typical scene in my clinic. You know, me, interpreter, patient, and then this lady who was a nurse who really helped us out um, in terms of knowing how the hospital runs and things like that. That's a lot of uh, kind of cultural things of how a hospital runs, don't want to step on people's toes, don't want to say, well, this is the way we do it, um, really listen to the way that's the way they do it, and then try to fill the void and provide the care that you feel the patient needs. This is David Cates, he's the executive director of Missoula Medical Aid. Some of you may know him or have seen him around campus. He 
is a writer and he helps teach some creative writing. Uh, Dave's about 6'5". You can see all these folks are all quite a bit shorter. Um, and, uh, but these are all, this, I told you about the crowd earlier, the who, you know, these people are like pushing in. We have, we're trying to see clinic patients and it's just like trying to shut the door and get everybody out so you can give the person who's deserving the time a little bit of privacy. I'm not sure that person cares. They're, it's just like, they're fine, let's talk about it and take care of everything. So machetes are the most common thing that people use in Honduras for work, for play, for housework, and for violence. Um, in a way, gun violence is almost better. Um, so as you can see, this butcher, he's not using a saw, he's using his machete to cut that hog up. Next door neighbor, save the, oops, oh, sorry, uh, save the children, sorry, that's the one I was going to, was warning you about. Uh, the next door neighbor's mowing his grass, so now you can close your eyes. Um, but violent, uh, you guys ready? Um, so this young man was blocking a machete shot. His cousin was killed in a machete fight. And his hand, this is the day we arrived, the, the general surgeon said, can you please come take a look at this? And so that's what's keeping his four fingers on, right there. And he'd cut the, this machete because he just went to block it and uh, it went right through his hand. You can see one of his fingers is already gone. We saved his other three fingers and reconstructed all his tendons uh, and his joints and pinned everything back together. A lot of things we see are congenital. Now, that's the grossest picture, by the way. We won't get that gruesome anymore. But you can see this person has, um, was born with duplicated thumbs. So two thumbs. And uh, those kind of things are treated in the United States, and we hardly even know these, that people ever even had those kind of things. Well, people grow, and, and they grow up with these multiple digits. And certainly, there's social stigma uh, to a lot of these things. Syndactyles. Growing up with fingers um, unseparated at birth, uh, and uh, see a lot of those, and uh, I've treated several of those. I'll show you kind of early um, what we do for those in a minute. Here's a fellow that came in who'd had his fingers chopped off with a machete. Um, I can't remember if it was a violent accident or a farming accident, and he had been treated by some traveling brigade, and he had what's called a, a groin flap. So they tied his fingertips to his, to his groin, and then three weeks later they separate him. Well, he comes in to see us on the day we were leaving with a sock wrapped around his hand, super sheepish. He probably was like living, if they had basements, he'd been living in the basement. I think he was so embarrassed. But these fingers were floppy. These tips were all floppy and hairy, and so he was completely embarrassed. And unfortunately, that fellow, was, like I said, it was the day we were leaving. Um, never came back. We said, we'll be back. Please come back and see us. And I've never seen this guy again. But I, would ch I could revise those and, and I think I could change this guy's life. I mean, I think in, in Honduras this guy probably has no chance of ever finding a mate because of this. Um, we see this was a machete injury where the person got chopped across the arm. He ended up getting treated. Plating is both fractures, but then he ends up growing all this extra bone. Can't rotate his forearm. That's not very good for a farmer. So we went in and took the, boat, took the plates out, cut this thing we call a synostosis out, allowing him to redevelop the ability to rotate his forearm. Burn contractures, very common. This young man, 19, 18, 19 years old, fell in a fire when he was a little kid. Contracture of the armpit. He, these are skin grafts. Uh, contracture of his abdomen, contracture of his elbow. Look at his wrist. N more than 90 degrees flexed. Um, this is his index finger. This is a stump of thumb. So I brought him back and straightened his wrist out. So again, here's the bent. I mean, it looks like a heel, doesn't it? And we fused his wrist straight, brought his thumb out, skin grafted him, straightened his index finger out, 
and gave him a hand that was not like this, like this. I was hoping he'd come back the next year and we could release the tightness in his, uh, uh, elbow, uh, his armpit, but we did not see him last year. I hope to see him this year. This is one of those syndactylies, fingers um, at birth together. We separated them. This is uh, congenital deformity. Um, this thing's called a delta phalanx. Um, this is a grown man, farmer. We talked to him about it, said we could straighten those out and fuse them. He said, no thanks. <laughs> He's gotten by this many years and he farms and he just, it's fine. Horrible uh, uh, growth deficiency uh, called radial forearm. Uh, congenital absence of radial uh, bone right here so that the, the child's hands fall over. It's kind of like a, uh, an analog would be most people know more about is club foot. We don't, that's something I couldn't treat. That, that's a months long treatment uh, that we can't, uh, we don't have time in one week to treat. So we can't treat everything. Um, and uh, we try to make referrals when we can. The nice thing is we take, um, when I first started going down, I went just me. Um, and I worked with all the local nurses and their local gear and it was very difficult. The nurses were great and everything, but trying to get things done uh, was very difficult. So over seven year, or seven trips, I've built these relationships and I've grown teams and we now take anesthesia, uh, surgeon, scrub tech, and circulating nurse and a PA. And the nice thing is, is the PAs we've taken have all been fluent Spanish speakers and they serve a great role. They're out, um, the way we set things up, we do a clinic on the first day and then we operate the rest of the week. The PA keeps cycling around and seeing patients because PA people here were there and they kind of cycle in um, and they keep seeing patients and, and it really has turned out to be a good team. Um, we've um, gradually brought um, fairly high-tech things to, to, to Honduras. This is Dr. Wendy Morris, an anesthesiologist, using an ultrasound machine to use a block so we don't have to use a general anesthetic, and, uh, which has been very nice for the patients there, especially considering the type of in-house care or lack thereof that they get. Um, and so it's been, a, it's been a, uh, enabled us to do a lot of things as outpatients. Um, we've generated a, or developed a great relationship with the general surgeon. The hospital actually has a general surgeon. Uh, we've developed this relationship and it's a gradual thing. First time I went, he didn't say a word of English to me. Hardly spoke to me. Kind of crossed and helped us a little bit. Now we arrive with a big hug. He speaks English. Um, I think he was embarrassed that his English wasn't very good. His English is great. Uh, orders of magnitude better than my Spanish. Um, and so uh, it's just been a great thing. He had us to his house for dinner this last trip and, and about 18 people and he quiets the crowd and gets up and thanks us and has a tear in his eye. This guy owns a hotel, has a private practice and works in the public hospital. He cares about his community and it's just an amazing thing and he cares uh, that we come. Sometimes Things aren't so easy. The power goes out in the middle of an operation. You have to make do. So everybody dons a headlight and we keep going. First time I went, we opened this sterile drape, only to find that guy right there, sterilized cricket. <laughs> that was one of the best laughs I've had about going to Honduras right there. This young lady had a tendon cut. She looks pissed, but she wasn't. <laughs> we fixed her tendon, and uh, hopefully it flexes. One problem I have with going is I don't get a lot of follow-up, um, which has been an interesting thing, because when I first went, there were no cell phones, and there was no way to contact anyone, to make kind of a plan if you weren't sure what you were going to do. Now everybody has a cell phone. I mean, it changes healthcare to just this simple thing as a cell phone. And maybe they'll pull down some of those wires off all those, all those uh, towers. Um, so this is the, the men's uh, ward at the hospital. And uh, they load four or five people in this little room and they just stack them in there. It 
teams develop. You can see as one of the early years, the ladies weren't smiling very big when we were getting ready, and all of us were, but uh, now they're very friendly, give us big hugs, and can't wait for us to come. They probably can't wait for us to go either, but um, it works out well. Um, Jana, our scrub tech, has just been unbelievable. She's a she's Missoula maid, grew up here, and uh, hardly left uh, Montana, and now she's been to Honduras seven or eight I think this might be her ninth trip down there. She's befriended the autoclave lady, um, who they're dear friends now. It's not all work. We, uh, we work hard in the day, and then the group reconvenes, and you certainly develop this family spirit uh, in a short period of time when you go on a group trip uh, like this. And when everybody gets back together at the end of the day and drinks beers, and celebrates what they've done and share stories. It, it's, uh, it really is a, a quick uh, group formation. I've been lucky. I've never been on any trips where there's any kind of real funky group dynamics. Um, and I, sometimes I can't see how there could be, but apparently there are. So always have to be aware when you do these trips what, uh, what your compadres are like. And I suppose sometimes you have to be uh, Sympathetic to others' needs, uh, but I just like to be loud and have fun and uh, do hard work and then play hard. This young man uh, had another machete injury, had cut all of his flexor tendons. Um, I had left to go home, and uh, this was a, a year, two years after we'd fixed this guy. Um, his only tendon that worked when I met him was in his small finger, and he could close his hand by overlap. He'd learned to overlap all four of his fingers to pull them down. And we took him back, and we fixed three fingers. And, and this was uh, sent to me by the PA who stayed an extra week of this guy having a Coke and a smile because he could hold on to the thing. Uh, he was very happy with his, his treatment. Various things happen in Honduras. The Honduran street dog is a savvy creature. Um, uh, will live forever um, and to have a standoff with the free range, free ranging bull. Um, but uh, anyway, um, uh, that's kind of the end of my pictures. And um, uh, I appreciate the, the you guys listening to me. And and I, I guess the takeaway uh, I think I said earlier is is that volunteerism is. Uh, is a great thing. It's one of the most satisfying things you'll ever do. Um, and the first time you impact someone's life for the positive, uh, it's addictive. And it, and it makes you want to do more. And, and, and there's so much that we have. And I feel sometimes guilty with what we have. And I think David Cates made me feel a lot better. I was buying a new home right when I went on my first trip and I go down there and I see these people living in these dirt floored shacks and I was feeling guilty and, and he said to me, you know Andy, um, you can't help where you were born or what you were born into, but what you can do is you can control what you do with that. Um, and if you, you know, I guess it comes down to a uh, how much you care about others and, and uh, if you don't do anything you have and you don't do anything with it, then maybe you should feel guilty. But if you have and you do something with that have to help others, you should not feel guilty. You can't help it. You weren't born in Honduras. You were born in Indiana or Ohio or Oregon, wherever you're from. Um, and so um, get out there and Help people out, volunteer. There are millions of places you can volunteer. And, and, and Missoula is a great place to learn that. Uh, we have a town that has an unbelievable uh, heart uh, for helping others. Um, I'd love to answer questions, carry on the discussion for a little while longer. Um, and uh, fire away. Yeah. So once you leave, is the <clears throat> do they still have access to like um, like the medication that they need, the antibiotics, and, and like even small amounts of like physical therapy? I mean, some of those look. Yeah. 
So uh, for our patients in the acute setting, like a surgical patient, you know, medications are kind of necessarily early on and then uh, and not in an ongoing fashion. So yes, if, if for instance uh, I treat a patient who has kind of a chronic infection, we'll leave six weeks worth of antibiotics for them to take. It's not as ideal as here where they get IV antibiotics for six weeks, but we do a big surgical cleanup and then leave them with six weeks of PO antibiotics. Pain medication is a super interesting thing down there. They, I mean, pain is such a social issue. Um, those people don't know what narcotic pain medication is. They know what pain is and they deal with it. It's amazing how little they need. Um, and they're all surprised and I think a lot of them get, if we give some narcotic pain medication out and I think it knocks them for a loop like beyond uh, understanding. <laughs> Um, therapy, I'm sorry. So the general surgeon does follow up for us and then we leave him specific instructions. And so some of them get therapy if they can come back to town, but so many of them are from, from a farm village that's a four hour walk away or a bus ride and then a two hour walk or whatever, many hours away that they're not coming back for therapy. And so we try to instruct them or instruct him to instruct them when they come out of their cast. And we do things in old school ways. You know, here you'd have some tendon reconstruction. Three days after surgery, you'd see a hand therapist who would pamper you and, and you'd have therapy three times a week for six weeks or 12 weeks or 18 weeks. There you put them in a cast like we used to do 30 or 40 years ago and you say it's six weeks, the cast comes off and get them moving. And you hope for the best and then make them better. Yes? So do you find it very challenging to do all the procedures in the old school ways? It, in a way, it's, um, it's kind of refreshing, but it is, it's kind of crazy to think about it and back off and have to bank on history. I mean, yeah, I'm getting old, but uh, I'm doing stuff that's way older than me, you know, and that we haven't been doing in hand surgery uh, in terms of the rehabilitation and things like that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and, and I usually take a textbook or two with me, especially for the kind of pediatric stuff. Because we don't see a ton of that. A lot of that in the United States ends up at university hospitals. And, and so you kind of have to bank on stuff you learned 17 years ago um, in, in fellowship. Yeah, so I usually take some, some books along. Yeah. Is this specifically a government agency, or does the funding come from community? It's all community-based. Uh, Missoula uh, Medical Aid was, uh, like I said, uh, hatched out of the tragedy of Hurricane Mitch. And it's completely non-governmental. Uh, all the money comes from Missoula and some, out, some outside funders, um, but they're mostly folks that have connections to people in Missoula. Um, I would invite you uh, to attend the Salsa Ball, which is our annual fundraiser. Get a little pitch in here. Um, it's always in November. It's a super fun party, um, and it's a low-pressure fundraiser. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering for you, uh, what are some of the biggest uh, personal and professional challenges that you face going to and then coming back from such a desperate setting? That's a great question. Um, you know, pulling up and leaving uh, from a professional standpoint, I don't have a ton of trouble with. Some people do, um, just in terms of leaving their practice. And, and certain situations, people really can't. I'm fortunate, I've got eight partners. They can, you know, I can be gone. Um, so from that standpoint, it's not a big deal. I tell you, um, it's a little bit of a personal thing when you come back after seeing these folks that have um, tremendous needs, very little complaint, and their, uh, their level of appreciation is profound to come home to sometimes see patients who complain about a very small thing tremendously and are unappreciative of your care. Uh, you know, I mean, as a uh, it's probably not something that you just talk about publicly all the time, but it's a reality. Uh, you, you deal with it, and, and you kind of burn on reentry a little bit, but, uh, but you kind of, you feel that for probably a month or more after you come back. Um, 
and maybe you're not as empathetic uh, to some smaller problems that we have here, first world problems. So is that kind of the essence of what you're asking about? Yeah. What would you say <coughs> you've learned professionally now? I think you've learned a lot in terms of uh, volunteerism and the, how, how meaningful that is. Is there anything you've learned professionally from your work in uh, like I think we touched on it a little bit, and it's this uh, ability to borrow from the shoulders of the people that I learned indirectly from, a generation or two generations before me as hand surgeons, things that um, we don't do anymore, but you have to do in the face of necessity. Like we're talking about casting a patient and kind of saying, okay, how is that patient going to rehabilitate themselves, which is the way we used to do everything, uh, pretty much. You know, six weeks of immobilization and then see how you do. Um, and it's a little hard to do that when you're, when you're trained in this mode of, of having this entourage of people to help you make people better, uh, of having therapists around you and, and all of that. And, um, and doing some things um, in a simpler fashion than maybe we would do here um, with less equipment, um, with no live x-ray. You know, we use live x-ray all the time in the operating room here, but I don't have that opportunity there. So you kind of have to make sure that your hardware placement, and you're just by feel, it's all going to be good, and then you get an x-ray afterwards. And, and if knowing that you might have to bring that patient back to the operating room if you didn't do it all right. My question is, does that make you a better surgeon? You know, that's a kind of judgment call. I, mean, <laughs> I would hope so. I'm not going to boldly beat my chest and say yes. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I think so. And I think that uh, you build, you know, as I just got done kind of, I mean, contradict myself, I think it makes you a more compassionate person too. Yeah. Good question, and it's been a really interesting uh, evolution. Uh, the first time I didn't take anything, and I used their equipment, and it was woefully inadequate, and that's kind of what made me kind of think. And then we take, we're allowed to take about 100 pounds per person, and a lot of that's medications for the primary care groups, but we've also gradually taken crate, pardon me, crate by crate, more equipment, we've gotten donated equipment, some older equipment that's not used in the hospitals. You know, a lot of places have gone from power to battery power, and so the old corded electrical equipment gets donated and we've taken it down. Um, some of the, um, uh, we had a donated, uh, uh, some organization donated a, a bunch of equipment to us and they even paid for us to ship a pallet down there. It stays down there. We've built this bodega in the back of um, uh, Save the Children, and uh, we have the, they keep a key to it, but they stay out of it. Um, we left some stuff at the hospital the first time, and that stuff, we came back and it was scrounged through, and, and it was, you know, just ruined for the most part. And, and so now we have this little, um, this little shed, and uh, we can lock it up, and we have shelves almost all the way around except for the door and just have stuff down there. Um, and we take more and replenish stuff and we kind of keep, we inventory it so that when we use stuff up, we try to garner those things as donations to take with us the next time. And for medications, like you said, the drugs, how do you get, just being a doctor, do you have a, a certain sort of authority to bring that across? Yeah, it's a little it's a little hairy at times because we carried you know we carried narcotics with us, um, and we just kind of bank a little bit on our DEA license and our medical license and you know talk our way through it. Midnight Express, man. <laughs> yes. Do you just have one team that goes down there, or do you have? Uh, it evolves. Mm -hmm. they, they vary. The, my, the orthopedic group that I go with is there's kind of a little core, like Jana, the, the scrub tech. She goes almost every time, and 
I had a couple of um, a, a variety of nurses go. Anesthesia changes pretty much every time. We have a couple of people have been two or three times. Um, and the, um, I was talking about the PAs. Uh, one PA from our uh, group went one time with me and then I ironically gave a lecture to the Idaho Association of PAs and uh, this guy comes running out afterwards and, and my fr uh, friend that introduced me told about my volunteer work um, in my introduction. He comes running after me and says, hey, what are you doing? What, tell me a little bit more about this. He has this affinity for Central America. He works in Boise and he speaks Spanish and he, he, he completely understands the kind of Latino culture and he's just at home there. And he's gone with us almost every time. And he is just an unbelievable uh, uh, help in there. And so he's kind of a constant. Yeah, the primary care teams, they, there's a few core people that go quite often, but those teams are really dynamic. They change every time. And how often do we go? So about um, two to three trips a year as it's kind of evolved. And I think there's been a couple of years when we've sent four teams, two to uh, San Lorenzo, two to La Esperanza. Pretty much always there's two to La Esperanza. Another portion of the organization I didn't mention is that um, some of the OBs in town have, um, uh, have created kind of what we've created in orthopedics in La Esperanza. Um, but OB care in San Lorenzo. Um, I can't speak to the details of that very much, but, um, but they're down there. Yeah. Um, what kind of documentation do you have to do there? So um, surprisingly, they're a little more stickler than I kind of thought they would be. But um, you know, we have to prove that uh, we have active medical license there in uh, the state that we practice in, um, and they always want a CV and they want uh, a, um, a documentation of your medical license uh, or your uh, medical degree. Uh, the nursing um, nurses have to present their licensure um, as well, and then um, you know, there's vaccinations. Those aren't required by them; they don't care. But um, you know, we all are vaccinated for hepatitis and typhoid. And so, do you have to do any charting like a patient? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. Um, I've been lucky enough, they, they have a social intern down there, and so when you finish medical school there, you kind of have this mandatory conscription, um, and there's always uh, uh, these interns. This is one of the evolutions of our, our relationship. The general surgeon is kind of in charge of that person, and the first couple of years, they're kind of, maybe they can help you a little bit, and they didn't really show up. I think they probably saw it as an opportunity to slip out the back door, um, but now they're with us the whole time, and they grease the skids for us. They do the documentation. I wish I would have brought a picture. I should have stuck a picture up here of the chart room. Um, it's a hallway behind the emergency room and these charts, and it's just rows on both sides of the hall, um, all these shelves with all these manila folders half falling off the shelf. It's like, oh, it's a nightmare. Um, but, again, but they have this system of organization they give, each patient this little bitty piece of paper with a little number written on it, and some way they get things done. I don't understand it, but I don't, I've, I've stopped wondering about it because it usually works out. <laughs> yeah. Do you find the wound care is different there because of the climate than here up in Montana? You know, that's a hard question to answer because of the short time we're there. And, um, you know, I, I open myself up to email communication with the general surgeon. And I say, if there's any trouble, you know, shoot me an email. That's the other thing that's kind of become much more, you know, just day to day in the, in since, just since 2005. Um, and I don't hear much from him. And, he, and I get this email six weeks later, or I finally email him when I haven't heard. All the patients are fine. 
in whose opinion? I, I, I hope they're all fine. Um, so um, anyway, um, but like I said, I've, I've grown to trust him, and, I, and he's a very good surgeon, and, and so I, I have to trust that all the patients are fine. That's the one thing that I always worry about is I don't get to do the follow-up. And uh, uh, so uh, am I really having a positive influence? I get some, I get like that young fellow I just showed you with the Coke bottle. He's ecstatic with his outcome. Well, this has been very inspirational, both on a personal level and in terms of the work that uh, Missoula Medical Aid is doing. So please join me in giving a round of applause. Yeah.